Hi, welcome to Island Federal Home Buyer Seminar. We're so glad that you could be with us today. My name is Amori Hernandez. I am the Home Lending Manager for Island Federal. And today we have actually a great team of speakers um, that are going to talk to you about the home buying process. And we have Stephen Bertolini with uh, Resource Realty. We have Laura Andres, who's a partner at Taylor, Eldridge and Andres, and Susan Barron from Land Baron Abstract. So again, welcome to our home buyer seminar, and we are going to really go over the entire process. So why Island? I get that asked quite a bit. And one of the things that we are proud of is our personal service. Everyone knows who's a member of Island Federal, um, that we actually are all about the service and taking care of our members. As a matter of fact, to become a member of, of Island Federal is very easy. We also have very competitive rates. As a credit union, we take pride in offering the best product and the best rates to our members. We also have a vast array of products that we offer to our members, which we're gonna to discuss today. And one of the best things that we always uh, believe in is the closing. Uh, there's no surprises at closing. As a matter of fact, we make sure that everybody leaves with a smile. And we service our loans. I'm gonna discuss that a little bit later. So another question I get asked on occasion is, what's the difference between a broker and a direct lender? Well, a broker is a third party. So you're going through a separate individual who is going to be uh, placing your loans with a lender. We are, of course, a direct lender. Um, so the question is, do they have your best interest in mind as a third party? We actually offer the mortgage that best suits your needs. Who pays for the services of the broker? Well, that's a good question. With Island, we don't charge any commission. Also, the broker has no say in the underwriting process whatsoever. Island Federal, we directly underwrite your loans. And with the broker, they sell your loans, where with Island Federal, we service them. So instead of dealing with a lender, let's say in Washington, California, or a different state, you actually are dealing with us directly here locally. So rent versus own. You know, if back in 2016, if you decided to buy a house and you compare it to today's market, you've done very well. And that's one of the things that we say is you want to get into home ownership as soon as you can. Of course, it's important to do it when you're ready, but take that leap of faith because of the fact that it will be something that will help you um, gain that wealth for you and your family in the future. So, you know, of course, with Island Federal, um, we actually go over what the process is in renting. So, first of all, um, instead of building your landlord's wealth, why not build your own? And uh, your monthly payment is basically is, is going to increase if you're renting. Uh, with When you have a mortgage, it's basically a fixed rate, a fixed monthly payment in regards to your mortgage. And um, the other thing is that you're limited to do when you're renting, you're limited to do things to your property. They might not want you to paint certain things or decorate a certain way or what have you. When you own your own home, you could do what you want with your home. And on top of that, um, with a, when you're renting, you actually have to come up with not only the first month, but there's also uh, an additional month and a security deposit, if you will, uh, which is in today's market be pretty equivalent to what is the down payment on a home. Um, so five reasons to buy a home. Well, home prices will continue to rise and it's been dynamic as we have seen that for the last few years. Either way, as I said before, you're paying someone's mortgage. Why not pay your own? Creating wealth for your financial future, uh, that nest egg that you're creating for yourself and for your family. And mortgage rates are projected to increase. Uh, I remember when I closed my first mortgage back in 1990, uh, I refinanced someone into an 8.875, which is um, compared to today, significantly higher. So. Again, rates are still now at an all-time low. And then make Uncle Sam your partner towards your financial goals. 
as you pay rent, you're not able to deduct anything uh, of your rent when you file your taxes. But once you're a homeowner, you're able to deduct the interest that you pay on your mortgage and the property taxes. And again, just going back to the history of rates, uh, again, and rates today, rates at, at low threes are incredible. When you think about any type of lending that you could get, any type of loan to get something in, in as low as 3.24, it just shows there's no better way uh, to get a loan on your money. So what's a pre-qualification compared to a pre-approval? Well, a pre-qualification is basically taking all the information that the client or the member tells us. Everything is verbal, nothing has been confirmed. And I would say you would have a hard time finding a realtor who's willing to show you any homes uh, without having an actual pre-approval. And the same token, they would not accept any offers unless you have a pre-approval. So what is a pre-approval? Well, we actually review all the documents that we request. And basically what they are is your tax returns over the last two years, pay stubs last 30 days, and bank statements last two months. I would like to call the three legs to a stool. Home inspection versus an appraisal. Well, a home inspection is something that once your offer has been accepted, now you have the option of getting your home inspected. And at that point, you want to be there as a home inspector goes around the house and points out certain things. Now, unless you're buying a brand new construct, construction home, um, you are going to expect certain items come up in the home inspection. And then the question is, do you want the seller to fix it or do you want to address it since you will be the one moving in? Now, compared to an appraisal, an appraisal basically is once you have, uh, you're into contract and now we start your mortgage process, now as the lender, we go out and make sure that your house is valued at least at the price that you're purchasing. Um, for, uh, that you're purchasing the house for. So that's what we do with the appraisal process. Now, if the appraisal comes in higher than what you're buying the house for, that's great news for you. Um, if it comes in lower, then at that point, you would have to have a discussion with your attorney to address that and say, okay, now it came in lower than I'm buying, what's my next step? And that's where your attorney would answer any questions you may have there. Down payment. So we have two examples. Example A is basically when you're putting 5% down, in this case, purchase price of 380,000 and 5% down is 19,000 with a loan amount of 361,000. At that point, anytime you're purchasing a house with less than 20% down, you will need what is called PMI or private mortgage insurance. And what that is basically, it's a company that's going to insure that portion of the loan. Now, example B, same purchase price, but you do have the 20%, which in this case would be $76,000. Uh, well, at this point, you do not need PMI. Again, if you have at least 20% down, no PMI is required. So some of you probably have heard FHA, and FHA is definitely uh, an option when it comes down to getting a loan. Compared to conventional loans, we find that FHA tends to be a bit more expensive in regards to the loan itself. Um, and right off the bat, you have what is called an upfront mortgage insurance premium of 1.75 that gets added to your loan amount, where with conventional, you don't have such a thing. In addition to that, with FHA, you, have, you are required to have this mortgage insurance now for the life of the loan, where with a conventional mortgage, it will come off once you've established 20% equity. So it will come off automatically once you've established 22%. But at this point, if you think you have 20%, you could definitely contact us and say, hey, I think my house is valued um, enough where I don't have PMI. And maybe it's a combination of you making certain um, enhancements to your home, upgrades, and also the market uh, improving as well. Meet Bill and Earl. So you have uh, Bill Fair and Earl Isaac, uh, who basically 
they, back in 1956, came up with the algorithm of FICO. And that's where actually the FICO uh, comes from, which is Fair Isaac Company. And the most important thing about credit, as you see here in the graph, is your payment history. So that's 35%. So let's expand on that a little bit. In regards to credit history and your payment history, let's say you had a lateness back in 2016. Actually, let's say it's four of them. And you recently had one lateness back in January of this year. Well, believe it or not, the one lateness will, will be a heavier hit on your credit score than what happened back in 2016. Uh, even though there were four latenesses back then, again, the most recent lateness or whatever happens in your credit within the last 12 months impacts you more than what happened years ago. So on top of that, then you have amounts owed. So that's at 30%. So rule of thumb is you wanna keep your balance 30% of your limit. So the best way I could explain that is if you have a credit card with a $1,000 limit, your balance should not exceed $300. Once it does, it starts pulling your score down a little bit. So you just have to be conscious of that. Then you have the length of your credit. So the length of your credit, you wanna make sure that you have had established credit for a while. So the requirement is that you have at least two years of credit history um, and two credit lines. So that's one of the things that you wanna start as a basic minimum. And then of course, the remaining 10% is you have new credit and then a mix of your credit where you could have, of course, a revolving credit card, you could have an auto loan that actually then helps um, in regards to your credit, having a bit of variety in regards to your credit history. So, of course, everyone's aware of the three credit agencies. You have TransUnion, you have Equifax, you have Experian. And as a lender, what we look at is the middle score. That is basically going to determine your rate. So, if you have borrower A who has, in this graph here, a 720 FICO score, and borrower B has a 660 FICO score, well, the lowest of the two is going to be the one that's taken consideration when it comes down to the interest rate that you will be getting. So it's important to always keep tabs on your credit. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So here's a, a perfect, uh, a good score range for you to follow. Um, and basically, once you're at 740 or above, you're getting top tier, best, in, best interest rate available to you. As your score continues to go down, the bigger the adjustment. So again, keeping tabs on your credit is very important. It could impact you quite a bit. All our members know that we offer CreditSense, and it's one of the products that we offer for free. And basically, it's a credit monitoring service that you're able to keep tabs on your credit and see where it's at. Um, it's, it's a wonderful tool. And in this day and age, I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure that you are, um, you are aware of your credit history. So I wanted to share with you the difference in how the credit score could actually impact you with regards to your mortgage. So in the first example, following the 361,000 loan amount, FICO score of 740, your principal and interest payment will be $1,521.99. Same loan amount, but FICO score 660, well, it's an increase of almost $150. You might think, oh, $150 is not that bad. But, but when you look at the life of the loan, it's a significant increase. We're talking about an excess of $50,000 of interest that you have to pay because of the lower FICO score. In addition, it also affects your PMI calculation, your PMI payment. Now, as a credit union, we offer our members the low, one of the lowest PMI payments available. That being said, your FICO score still factors in in regards to your PMI payment. So, following up with the same loan amount of 361, well, 
you have a 740 FICO score, your monthly payment is only $105.21, which is just a little bit over $25 a week. But look at the difference when you look when you have a 660 FICO score. You have a, an increase of almost three, well, the increase itself equals to almost $300 a month. And that could be significant, especially as a homeowner. The more money you put down, as you see here, the lower your PMI payment. Why? Because you're taking a bigger uh, buy-in into the price or into the purchase of your home. Qualifying ratio. So you'll see this qualifying ratios and basically you have your front qualifying ratios, which as a lender, we take your gross monthly income and we calculate what would be your monthly payment in your mortgage, which is your principal and interest, property taxes, homeowner's insurance, PMI, if you are putting less than 20% down, and other fees like maintenance fees if you actually are buying a condo. So then we divide that payment by your monthly income and that's your front ratio. Normally, you're looking to be somewhere in the low to mid 30s. Ideally, we have approved loans that are higher in ratios, but there are other stronger compensating factors you have great credit score and, um, and of course, maybe strong in assets. So these are things that help you in regards to the qualifying process. And then you have what is called the back ratio where we include the rest of the debt on your credit and that cannot exceed 45% or should not. Have we approved people for more than 45%? Absolutely. Again, you have other strong compensating factors that have allowed us to approve your loan, even exceeding 45%. So the down payment normally that you would need to buy a home, the minimum down payment for a conventional mortgage is 3%. Well, except if you come to Island Federal, we understand how difficult it is to pay rent and save for a home. So as far as I'm aware, we're the only one that offers 100% financing on the mortgage of your home or the purchase of your home. So in other words, we're financing the complete purchase price of your home. As the buyer, all you have to do is pay your closing cost. Now, how does that work? It's very simple. Let's say your closing costs are $15,000, easy number to follow. And then I contract, you're gonna put down $10,000. Well, when you get to the closing table, now you only have a balance of $5,000 to pay because we're taking that $10,000 that you put at contract and applying it to your closing cost. And that's how basically it works. So it's a dynamic program. Uh, and again, we're here to make sure that as Long Islanders, you realize your dream of home ownership. And we're doing everything we can to do that. The other thing that we actually offer is we value the heroes in our community. Uh, everywhere from frontline workers, uh, first responders, our educators, and our veterans. Um, and when it comes down to closing costs, again, we keep things simple. We have one fee, which is an underwriting fee of 595. That's us as a lender, 595. Well, for the heroes in our community, what we decided to do is to give back and to say thank you for all that you do. So we decided to waive that 595. In addition, the credit report fee of $35, we are also paying for that. So again, it's a small token of appreciation for our heroes who do so much. Now, another program that we have, which is an exclusive product as well, is our alternative financing mortgage program. And this is for those self-employed individuals that are basically in a position where they're forced to rent. Now, for whatever reason, they don't show whatever the qualifying income is in order to purchase a home. It could be a variety of reasons why, but the business does well. So we decided to introduce this program for those that are self-employed, and the requirements are pretty simple. First of all, this is for a primary residence only. Um, your minimum FICO score is 700. It's for a purchase or refinance. Loan amount up to a million. You have to be in business for two years and your rate lock fee is refunded. Now, the maximum loan to value 
is 75%, which means you're putting 25% down. Or if you're refinancing, the maximum you could refinance is up to 75%. This program is credit and asset based. We are not going to ask for tax returns. The only thing we do ask for is for a letter from your accountant stating that you've been in business at least two years and that you're in good standing. That's it. Again, we're trying to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to achieve that dream of home ownership, even if you're self-employed. And this program has helped so many people realize that dream. Home buyer checklist. Well, I already went over it, but I'll go over it again. So what we request, and again, part of the pre-approval process is tax returns for the last two years, including your W-2s. If you're self-employed and you want to be able to purchase a home, um, then we also need your business returns for the last two years and a profit and loss for the current year. Wage earners, going back to that, Pay stubs for the last 30 days, bank statements for the last two months of all your assets and all pages. Sometimes page six, you'll see it says blank. Well, we wanna see page six, usually the underwriter does, just to make sure that it is blank. And then your history of employment and residence for the last two years. So how do you get started? I know you're excited. You say, okay, I want to go ahead and start this journey. Well, we, make it island easy. So what you could do is go on our website, go into Island Federal, islandfcu.com. And when you go into home lending, you go into mortgages, you're going to see this page. And on the bottom right hand corner, you see that what looks like an iPad icon. You're gonna say apply now. And you'll be able to start the process and complete it in 10 minutes. And once you complete it, we actually receive notification instantly and we start working on that pre-approval or refinance application right away. And in addition to that, you'll have one of our trusted home lending officers reach out to you just in case there might be some information, some additional information that we need from you. This is Islandopoly. So basically it's the steps of home ownership. And, um, We'll make sure that if you actually send us an email, we'll make sure that we share this with you. Build your power team. The individuals here, uh, we feel that they have tremendous amount of experience and they specialize in what they do. Um, so we're very fortunate to have them here with us today. So at this point, what I want to do is introduce to you Stephen Bertolini with Resource Realty Group. Steven is very dynamic because in addition to him being a realtor, he's also a New York State certified appraiser. So you're getting the best of both worlds. Steven, thank you for being with us today. It's all yours. Thank you, Amori, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Island Federal. This is a very special day. And um, I'm gonna piggyback off of what Amori was talking about before with the pre-approval. Pre-approval is one of those things that if somebody calls me up and they're looking to purchase a property, first thing I'm gonna ask them is, are you pre-approved? If they say yes, that means they're ready to go. So when we do find that property, we're gonna be, I will be calling up that agent and saying, hey, I wanna look at ABC 123 Street, and the first question out of their mouth is, is your buyer pre-approved? So right off the bat, you're pre-approved, you're ready to go, and that is first and foremost. Let's go to the first slide. The three words that people hear most are location, 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 okay? Now, I'm gonna break it up into two different sections. The first being school district and neighborhood characteristics. There's a site that I use called bestplaces.net, okay? This is going to give you the population. It's gonna give you the um, unemployment rate. It's gonna give you of a whole complete scorecard of the school district from the elementary school all the way through to the high school. Okay, so I would definitely check that out. It's one of those tools that you should keep in your arsenal. If you're using other things, great. This is just an added bonus. Okay, and the next section we're gonna to go to is the proximity to. Now with me and my family, the I wanted to stay within the 40 mile rule. 
The 40 mile rule, in my opinion, is 40 miles from my office, which is about an hour in travel time. So if you can stay within that time frame, you're way ahead of the curve. And to me, leaving the office and coming back to my sanctuary, which is my house, is terrific. Okay, that's what I like as a homeowner, to come home and see my family and relax. Okay, the other thing is, when you're looking at location, 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 it could also mean, is there shopping nearby? Is there uh, a lounge that you frequent, restaurants? Is it a family first neighborhood? Okay, because my location and your location might be two different things. My location was, how close am I to my family? Okay, is my mom close by? Is my brother and sisters, are my children close by? That's what I'm looking for in my location. Okay, but check out that bestplaces.net. You can't go wrong, it's gonna give you a lot of really great information. Which home fits your needs? Now, I'm gonna talk to you about the single family, multifamily, and single family is what I chose to live in. Okay, I come from the city. Having a single family is something that I truly wanted. I always wanted that as a child. I wanted that house, I wanted the backyard. I wanted the in-ground pool. That's what I wanted, okay, and that's what I got. Now, that might be great for you, but I also want you to consider maybe considering a multifamily. Now, multifamilies on Long Island are far and few between, but when you get into the boroughs, it's commonplace. Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan. And what it does is, is two things. You can have, you can live in whichever floor out of the two or three family you live in, which is your living room, dining room, bedroom areas, bathroom areas, but then the other units are income producing. So when you have something that might be income producing, what you're doing is you're paying down your mortgage, paying off your taxes, and it becomes a retirement vehicle. So a lot of people aren't considering buying an income producing property, but it's just a little food for thought, okay? Now, the condo, co-op, and homeowner association, I lump together. Condo and co-ops are, I think, great if you're looking for a maintenance-free lifestyle. Typically, you, you, you have somebody that comes in and does your landscape, snow removal, okay? Uh, I think that's terrific. Also, you have your mortgage, you have your taxes, but on those three items, the, the condo, co-op, and homeowner association, you have separate fees attached to it. Now those fees are either homeowner association fees, maintenance fees, and they're typically anywhere between $250, and I've seen them go up as high as, as $2,000. So you got your single family, your multifamily, your condo co-op, homeowner association. Just take a look and see which might be good for you if you haven't thought about these, okay? Let's go to the next slide. Now, what do you want? Now, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms. Are you looking for a basement, looking for a large yard? The only way that you can really figure out what you want is your pro and con list. But also, make sure that you, you convey it to your realtor. Because as a realtor, if I know you're looking for a house specifically that has central air condition or an in-ground pool, okay, whichever it may have, you convey that to me. I am not gonna show you apples when you're looking for oranges. So every single house that we look at that you're asking me to find for you is going to have exactly what you're looking for. Now, it takes a lot longer than just a few minutes talking. Usually somebody in my office for an hour, hour and a half, really coming to getting to know you before you can decide on what's right for you. Now, I've had clients that say, I don't want a house without a garage. You know, because they're coming from the city and a two car garage or a one car garage is key. But if you don't convey it to your realtor, we're not gonna show you exactly what you're looking for. So convey everything you possibly can. And I really appreciate that as a realtor. Okay, now what I'm gonna talk to you about is a must have list, but I'm also gonna tell you a, a, a personal story beyond this, okay? I had a client and on her list, she wanted a four bedroom, 
two and a half bathroom. She wanted it to be on budget and she wanted the modern kitchen with the French door, opening refrigerator, stainless steel appliance, quartz. She wanted a unbelievable kitchen was really important to her. He wanted a two car garage, an in-ground pool, a large yard for ent entertainment, and also a finished basement with potential income. Now, what they winded up buying was a four bedroom, two and a half bathroom, huge yard with room for a pool and a partially finished basement. Now that was overall there. After three months, we finally found them their dream house. And it winded up being great because at the closing table, all I saw was smiles and tears. And it was a great day for me being their realtor, finding them what they wanted was, was not easy, but we did it and we got to the closing table. And it took us a long time to find exactly what they, we were looking for. Now I tell you this story because I have a personal story. When my daughter was in 12th grade, they had a, a meet the teacher night. And I know you're probably thinking they have meet the teacher night in 12th grade. Well, they do, they had it. And my wife winded up going and um, it was very interesting. You know, she, she told me afterwards, but she went into the, the school and uh, she went through all the classes. And the last class was a, was a psychology class. And um, she winded up sitting in your, you sit in your child's chair. So she was sitting in the chair and um, it said, how well do you know your child? And um, she opens the booklet up. She takes the, the tests. After she leaves, she comes back home and we were just having something to eat. And of course, I always read it by saying, hey, babe, how was your day? We're sitting down. And she said, well, you're not going to believe this. I actually went to the meet the teacher night and I took a test. I said, you took a test. I said, oh, OK, <laughs> what kind of test did you take? She said, I took a test about how well do I know my child? And I said, oh, you must have done great. I said, you know, how'd you do? She said, I got three out of six correct. I said, three out of six correct. I said, that's not that good. She says, OK, do you want to take the exam? I said, OK. She gets me a pen. She gives me a pad and she begins to ask a simple question. OK, the way she was given these questions. And the first question was, what's your child's favorite color? I said, well, my favorite color is red. So I'm guessing it's it's red. Wrong. I was completely wrong. It was yellow. Next question. What's your child's favorite food? I said, I don't know, pizza? It wasn't. My daughter is five foot two and weighs 110 pounds, but likes everything. Okay. The only question that I got right was what is her favorite band? At that time, it was Panic at the Disco. And I knew it because we just talked about it the other day. Okay. It's the only question I got right. And I love my children. I thought I knew my daughter. I've loved her every second of every day since I saw her little foot kick my wife's belly. But I didn't know, I could have learned more about her, okay? So what I'm saying is this, when you're looking for a house, you have to know what you're looking for. You have to have that pro list, you have to have that con list. If you're doing it on your own, that's great. It's gonna be a lot easier because you're only dealing with one person. But if you're doing it as a couple and you have a partnership, you have to have that pro and con list and you have to check out, check off all the boxes because it can't be where somebody is, somebody loves one thing about the house, but not the other thing about the house. You have to be in 100% agreement. It's got to be in agreement or else you won't flourish. Okay. I wish you my kind of success. Island Federal, I, I just want to say thank you very much. And I, if there's any questions, please feel free. I look forward to answering anything. I'm Stephen Bertolini. Thank you again. Thank you, Stephen, for that. It was tremendous. Thank you for the story. Uh, it's, it's a great reminder that if you are buying a house with someone else, that you both, or if it's more than two, all be on the same page.
So thank you. At this point, I have the privilege of introducing Laura Andres, and she's a partner at Taylor, Eldridge, and Andres. And one of the things I always say in a seminar is if you have a heart condition, you don't go to a general medicine doctor, you go to a specialist. And that's what Laura does. Laura specializes in real estate. So at this point, Laura, thank you for being here so much. We greatly appreciate it and it's all yours. Thank you, Amore. Um, thank you to Island Federal Credit Union for putting this seminar together. So to recap a little bit, um, your first step when you want to buy a house, you would start with Amore and you would speak to, or Island Federal, and you would speak to them and get your pre-approval. You would take it then to your realtor or Steve and from there, uh, with that pre-approval, you will know what you can afford and what kind of uh, houses you should look at. Then once you find your house um, and the deal is struck and the offer and acceptance are, are made, um, the realtor will then put together a binder. And on that binder is all the details that I would need as the uh, seller's attorney and also as the buyer's attorney to know um, what was agreed to between the parties. So you'll have the binder and it will have the party's names, their addresses, the property description, uh, the purchase price, how much you agreed to put down on contract, how much you agreed to put into the whole transaction. Um, some people will call uh, the down payment the whole amount that they're bringing into the transaction. Us attorneys call the down payment what you're putting down on contract. So you'll always put some money down at the contract stage. Um, the binder agreement will also talk about how much of a mortgage you're getting and um, when you anticipate the closing to be, whether it's going to be 60 days from the time you enter into contract, which is an average time or longer or shorter. And then many times um, along the side of the binder, it'll say subject to the uh, home inspection because sometimes we will get this binder agreement before your home inspection. And um, it just, it will stay that so you know you're not bound to, to the uh, agreement until after the inspection is approved by the buyer. Then um, also some realtors will have a, um, a second page, which will talk about what is included in the purchase. Are the sheds included? Are the sheds coming down? Um, sometimes they'll talk about if there's any certificate of occupancy issues. Basically, everything that the attorneys need to know what to put into the contract. And so this is a very important document that you may want your attorney to review uh, before you sign it. Um, and as you'll see at the bottom of, of the agreement, the attorneys will be listed. And um, without this information, it's hard to get to a contract uh, quickly. And in markets such as these, you want to get to contract as quickly as possible so that you, uh, as a buyer, wouldn't miss out on this, this deal. Now, the mortgage amount that you put there is very important because um, the purchase will be contingent most times on a mortgage, unless it's an all cash deal, but most people get mortgages. And so you want to know how much of a mortgage you're having so that when your 45 days in the contract contingency comes up and something happens and for some reason you don't get your mortgage, you would get your down payment back. Um, but getting a proper pre-approval from a bank like Island Federal Credit Union will usually keep you from getting into that sort of bind. They're not going to give you a pre-approval pre if you're not going to be approved in the end. Um, so one of the um, items that may go uh, on the binder and then flow through to the contract is uh, terms such as as is. Now, what does as is mean to, um, to the attorneys and to the buyers and sellers? Well, to us attorneys, uh, a typical as is means that the house has to be at closing in the same condition as it was at the inspection before you went to contract. 
so that if the roof falls in, it has to be fixed. If there's a, a minor plumbing leak, it has to be fixed. Now, sometimes as is could mean it's completely as is, and no matter what happens, you're closing with it that way. That is very rare. Most of the time, it's under the first definition of as is where um, the sellers keep the house in, in the same shape, less reasonable wear and tear. Um, if there's a pool, it usually has to be in uh, working order. All the plumbing, heating, electric, air conditioning, in-ground sprinklers, everything that was working should be working also at closing. And that term goes into the contract. Now, if uh, at your inspection before contract, you find that there's other issues uh, that the seller agreed to repair, you want to make sure that's in your contract. If it's not in the contract, the sellers are not bound. Um, so the most important thing that you want to think of is, again, like Stephen was talking about, communication. When you sit down with your attorney or nowadays Zoom or by phone call, you want them to know everything you discussed with your realtor, everything that you discussed with your bank, how much money you're putting into the process, what kind of uh, details of the house do you expect? Um, was there, when will the closing date be? Um, another issue uh, that goes into the contract is um, your rate lock. So it, it's in the contract that you have to have your commitment by a certain date and you have to close by a certain date. If you decide to lock in your rate and the rate lock expires before the contract date, that's going to be on you. So that's why you want to use experienced people who like attorneys, realtors, and the bank so that they know when to lock you in and what to make you obligated for. So. After you uh, sign your binder and after you sit down with your attorney and go uh, to closing, I mean to, to contract, then you're going to work through your mortgage process and then the closing time comes. And at the closing, uh, before the closing, you'll do a final walkthrough with your realtor. And that's again a time where you have to communicate to your attorney if something is wrong. So that before the closing, uh, if there is uh, something missing from the house that you expected to be part of the transaction or something not working, it can be addressed before the closing and fixed before the closing. Um, so again, communication is the key. Uh, we're going to be answering a lot of questions. It's very difficult for me as an attorney to have 10 minutes to talk to you about a million things that I could talk to you about. Um, but thank you for your attention. And, uh, Thank you again, Maury. Thank you, Laura. Um, so actually, Laura just reminded me of something very important. So when you're starting this process and you've found a house um, and you already have your offer accepted and then you start the mortgage application, you're going to receive what is called the loan estimate. And the loan estimate basically is going to give you what would be the estimated closing cost or in other words, your worst case scenario. Laura was just talking about closings. So with regards to closing, prior to closing, three days prior to closing, you're going to receive what is a closing disclosure. And since we already will have the actual closing date, that basically is going to have your closing costs itemized. So it's something that you will receive again, no later than three days before you close. Thanks again, Laura. Uh, so at this point now, we have the privilege of having Sue Barron or Susan Barron with us. Sue has been in the title business for 35 years. And I'll tell you this, as a consumer, it's very important that you know this. You have the right to choose a title company that you want to use. You're not obligated in any way to go with any particular title company. We've worked with Sue for many years, and I, I'll tell you, um, Sue is, she makes herself accessible. And that's the reason, believe it or not, her cell number is there. I mean, I don't know of anybody else as a business owner that'd be willing to do that, but that's how Sue operates. She makes sure that she makes herself available for her clients. 
So again, Sue, thank you so much for being here today. And um, if you could just share with us the important factors of title. Sure thing. Thanks, Amori. Thank you, Island Federal. Title insurance, a little boring. However, it's not really boring. It's actually quite interesting, primarily because you get to dig into the history of the property. And what I mean by that is you truly get to see everything about the house through searches, through judgments, through lien searches, through a certificate of occupancy search, and through deed searches. So what do we determine first? We determine who owns the property. That's through the deed search, last owner search, they call it. Uh, we also find the certificate of occupancy to make sure that your house has a valid CO with everything in working order, that you know that attached garage was attached and part of the CO, that that extension was part of a certificate of completion. Because you want to make sure you're buying a house that is truly in working order. And the only way to determine that is to get the thumbs up from the town and they issue the certificate. We also have, um, uh, through uh, other searches, we find out if there are any mortgages on the property. The reason why you want to know this is because you want to make sure that the house that you buy is free and clear of any mortgages. So we do the mortgage search on the property, and then at the closing, we make sure that a payoff letter is issued so that we could pay off the seller's mortgage. That's important so that you have clear title. Third, we want to make sure is that we want to make sure that there are no liens on the property. See here, there's reference to a mechanics lien. That can occur when your seller decides to renovate his house and hires a contractor, a general contractor. The general contractor doesn't pay their mechanics. The sellers paid their general contractor, but for some reason it didn't flow down. So you want to make sure that these liens that might be on the property because the the subcontractor or the general contractor didn't pay the mechanic uh, gets taken care of. The property survey. So what we like to do is order a property survey search. What we do is we locate the survey. And if for some reason we can't find a survey, then we'll let your attorney know and your attorney will advise you to order a new survey. Why do we need a survey of the property? You wanna make sure that what you're buying is what you're buying. And the only way to do that is through a survey. The survey will dictate everything along the property lines so that you know exactly what you own. You don't want there to be any out of possession issues. Owner's policy. Let's talk about this because it's really important for you to know that buying a title insurance policy is not like buying a homeowner insurance policy. With a title insurance policy, you buy it, you own it, it's a one-time fee at the purchase of the property. It's set by the state, the fee, it's a statutory fee, and it insures you for the entire time that you own that property, assuming that you don't go and try to convey a portion of it to someone else. So assuming that you do decide to buy the insurance policy, which is that one-time fee, you will be insured. And for an additional market value rider policy, you can get for a couple of hundred bucks, you can get the insurance to increase to the value of the home. When you go to sell or when there's a defect or if there's anything during the time that you own the property that somebody's claiming title to it because you initially just own the, the, the policy for what you purchased, the price, the purchase price of the policy. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, I know attorneys that actually will not represent the client unless they purchase an owner's policy. That's how serious they actually believe, uh, how important it is to have that policy. And it's a great rider, the fact that they could actually increase as the value of the home increases. So that's fantastic. So, so far we covered everything that we thought would benefit you throughout the journey of buying a home. And we want you now to start sending us those questions. We're going to be here for the next few minutes and answer any questions that you may have. And uh, you know, take advantage of the amount of years of experience that you have here. And we'll do our very best to answer all your questions. 
Thank you once again. Now it's time for us to answer your questions. If I'm going to be a first time homeowner, what should I do now to prepare? I would say the best place to start is looking at your credit, looking at your liabilities in regards to what your debt is, because that will factor in in the process of qualifying for a mortgage. So that would be a good place to start. Next question is, do I have to have an account at the same bank or credit union as my mortgage? No, you don't. You could go to any lender that you wish, and it does not have to be the same lender. I will tell you the benefit of having your mortgage with Island and also doing your banking with us. It makes a transition in regards to payments, anything else that you might need to do with regards to your bank account. It makes it a lot easier if you do. Next question is, what is the minimum down payment? So normally conventional requires a 3%, Fannie Mae 3% down. But as I mentioned earlier, we do have an exclusive mortgage product where we finance 100% of the price of the house. And all you have to do is pay for the closing cost. Again, I don't know of any other lender that offers that as a conventional mortgage. Next question is, what do I need to tell my realtor about my finances? Well, really, it's up to you. You're really not obligated in telling your realtor specifics. You could tell them that you are pre-approved. Sometimes when making an offer, they might ask for the cover sheet of your credit report. I've seen that. But more than that, really, it's, it's something that's completely up to you. You're not obligated in sharing your information. Um, again, that is what the pre-approval is for. Next question. Will you finance a Florida investment single family residence? If you are a current Island Federal member, we follow you wherever you go. We'll finance the property regardless of where you are in the United States. What steps can I take to get a lower interest rate? So you could definitely do some research and find out exactly what the bank is offering in regards to rates, what you qualify for as regards to rate. The FICO score does factor in, so does the loan to value. So these are things that you have to look at and you know, do the research. We live in an age where you could find out all the information really from the comfort at your home at whatever time. So go on the computer and, uh, and you could, of course, give us a call or email us if you have any questions. For a, couple of, for a couple, how will it be determined whose credit will be used for a loan and what is the process? So as I said earlier, the, if you have two people applying for a mortgage, the lenders use the lower of the two. That is going to determine what rate you will get. Again, combination of the FICO score and the loan to value. Next question is, how much income do I need to get pre-approved? Well, how much income do you need to get pre-approved? Well, it really depends on how much you are looking to buy. Um, there's the factor where you could be pre-approved for a certain amount, but you feel comfortable paying another. So it really determines, it really depends on what is the income that you, or the price of the home that you're looking to buy. Um, that will determine basically if you qualify for it or not. And uh, maybe sometimes what you need to do is look at, okay, maybe I'm looking to buy the house with someone else and that will enhance your chance of being pre-approved for a higher amount and for a higher purchase price. Uh, what are some first time home buyer benefits? Well, here at Island, what we do is we're offering, uh, regardless if you're a first time homeowner, we're offering basically the best product you could find in the industry. Um, as I mentioned, everyone who is listening to us here today, we're waiving the only fee that we actually charge, which is the underwriting fee of $595. Um, and the fact that as a credit union, you're getting probably one of the best rates that you could find, again, out there in the industry. At what point do you get title insurance and does the binder agreement allow you to 
back out if negative findings are found. So which one of you two would like to tackle that one? Well, you can certainly do a title search prior to going to contract so that you could see exactly what you have um, right displayed before you and then you'll know. So you can certainly do that even before you sign a binder. You could do that in your search, right? When you're just going from house to house, you find something you like and uh, everything is a public record. You don't even have to get the title insurance at that point. You can just look for yourself because it's all a public record with the county clerk. Yeah. The insurance gets issued at the closing. Right. And um, the bo you're, not, you're not bound by just the binder. After contract, you're bound. Okay, great. Thank you. Does a pre-approval expire after a certain period of time, 90 days? Actually, it's good for 120 days. As a lender, that's when we have to rerun your credit report. It's after 120 days. Can you explain how leased versus own solar panels on the house and how it may affect selling or buying your home? That's a great question. Laura? So when, when uh, solar panels are, are leased, you have to have the solar panel company agree to assign the lease to the new, um, the new buyer. And so you'll have to coordinate that. It's not usually a big deal. Um, if you do owe payments on purchased ones, so if you purchase them and they're not leased, uh, you'll either have to pay off that company depending on what your contract says, or you'll have to, or the buyer can res uh, accept those payments for the future. Okay, great. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. When looking at bank statements, what are you looking for to determine pre-approval? So, uh, very good question. So, of course, as a lender, we're looking at large deposits. Um, and if there are large deposits, we need to know the source of where that money is coming from. Um, sometimes, let's say you might get a gift from a relative, which is perfectly fine. You can. Uh, we just need to show that the money or the gift money is coming from that person's account. So we need to show what we call a paper trail of that deposit. And that's what banks look for. So to expand a little bit further, if you have a cash large deposit uh, and it cannot be sourced, which in most cases cash money cannot, um, then at that point you cannot use that money for the purchase of your home. Uh, but in the same token, going back with cash, let's say you had a used car and you sold it um, again, we would like to see the bill of sale of the vehicle, the fact that it was registered to you. So these are documentation that, again, could be provided to uh, validate where the money is coming from. What's the difference between a rate and an APR? So your mortgage payment is based on your interest rate. Now, the annual percentage rate is a good indicator to inform you as the buyer if there's any additional fees that that lender might be charging you. So for example, you'll see that our interest rate and our APR, there's really a very small difference between the two. Why? We don't have a lot of what people call junk fees, where if you do see a significant difference between the interest rate and the annual, uh, and the APR, um, the annual uh, rate percent, yes, the NPR, um, then at that point, you'll see that there is a big difference. Well, there might be some additional fees that the lender or that broker might be charging you. So that's where you have to, to do your due diligence and make sure that um, you're being informed of all the fees that are being charged to you. What is the difference between a bank and a credit union? I get asked that question quite a bit. So as a credit union, we are a nonprofit lender. Um, so that means to our members, uh, which again, very simple to be a member here at Island Federal. Um, so that means that we're offering the best rate and the lowest closing cost that we could offer um, to our members, where you compare to, let's say, a for-profit lending organization or bank. Um, well, then uh, basically the name says it, it's for-profit. We tend to be more competitive as a nonprofit lending institution. 
Stephen, I think this question is for you. Um, when is the best time to buy a home? It's a, a, a great question. I get it all the time. And the truth of the matter is, it doesn't make a difference what time of the year it is, winter, spring, summer, or fall. It's, it's always a great time to buy a house. But the most important thing is making sure that you are pre-approved right before we do anything. It shows me and it shows the the sellers of the house that you're ready, willing, and able to buy that house. So the one thing that I will tell you is if it takes a couple of, a month or two or three, whatever it is for us to find that dream house for you, make sure you keep on putting that money away. So when you do get that property and they say, yes, we can make it really easy and get you to the closing table. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Yep. Another question is, should we pay for home inspections? What do you say, Stephen? Uh, home inspection is one of those things that is, I would say it's, it's an absolute must. I make, whenever I send in a, uh, a sales agreement or a binder, I always put uh, two contingencies on that. One is the appraisal to make sure that it, that it appraises for what you're purchasing the property for. And the other is a home inspection. Home inspection, unless you're buying a brand new house that the town has already checked the house from the foundation all the way up to the roof line and everything in between, the sheetrock, the lumber, the plumbing, everything has been checked for you. So you don't have to worry about that. But when you're buying a house that someone has lived in even five years or older, absolutely get the home inspection. I can't tell you how important it is because what it does also is it shows you behind the walls. So these inspectors that go to visit properties, they're using so many tools that we don't have with our naked eye. So it's, it's one of those tools that if you don't get a home inspection, it's, you, you don't have to get a home inspection. I would highly recommend it because if, if, if it finds something that might be a structural issue might be something that um, is just a plumbing issue or an electrical issue it also could sometimes become a bargaining chip for it to be fixed before you close or you might get a credit uh, for that specific house that you're buying so absolutely unequivocally in my opinion home inspection is extremely important get it actually I want to expand that a little bit and, and throw that question to Laura as well as the attorney so the home inspection, how important is that? Uh, the home inspection is very important. Uh, when you go to close, the house is supposed to be in the same condition as when you went to contract. And sometimes it, there can be some contention over uh, what what was the house, what, how, what did the house look like, and, and what was needed repair and what didn't. So you can use that home inspection to say, look, my inspector said that this was working at the contract time, mm -hmm. and now it's not. You have a leaky faucet, or there's a hole in the wall because there's pictures in, in the inspection report. And you really want to know, a house can look great, and you don't know until you have the home inspection, and it really will be the determination of not buying a house. Because sometimes you'll say to yourself, well, I'm already maxing out what I can afford, I'm not going to be able to afford to put a roof on, which you wouldn't know without a home inspection. So it's very important. Great. Thank you Thanks both. Thanks for giving me that opportunity. Oh, sure. Thank you both. Laura, I have a question for you. When should you give a landlord notice that you're moving? So each, each instance is different, so you should always speak with your attorney and communicate to them um, what kind of notice your lease requires. Um, but to be safe, you don't want to give official notice until at least after your commitment. So you can mention to your landlord, I'm in contract, I'm waiting uh, for my commitment date, and, and then you know we expect to close on or about or in the month of June or in August. Give them an idea. Um, your lawyer will be able to tell you exactly when, when to tell them. Okay, great. Thank you. And Laura, again, how much are closing costs? So the closing costs can, everybody has a different definition for closing costs. The, the title company, the bank, your attorney. So I can tell you a really good estimate after contract, 
After you have your loan estimate from the bank, um, I'll then get an estimate from the title company that'll tell me uh, how much uh, your title insurance will be and all of the searches. So that's, that's kind of how much you'll know to do. Right, and yeah. you'll, you'll it, you really have to, I don't have those numbers, right. I have to seek them out from everyone else and it really depends on your particular deal. Right, and that's where again, as I mentioned earlier, that you will receive a loan estimate which gives you basically what should be your worst case scenario. Um, and it'll, it'll prepare you for, okay, this is the amount of money that I should be ready to pay at closing. And what we tend to do is, and also other lenders is, we do send your closing disclosure three days prior to your closing so you know the exact numbers of your closing cost. What is the difference between home insurance and title insurance, Sue? Well, home insurance is something that you purchase once you've purchased your house that is a yearly premium. Title insurance is a one-time fee. You purchase it at closing and it covers, for you, it covers you the entire time that you own your house. Great. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> if you don't purchase title insurance, can you actually lose title of the home? Believe it or not, you can. Uh, we have seen instances where People did not purchase what they call a fee policy of title insurance, and we've had liens that have gone on the property prior to that purchase that for somehow did not get satisfied. Either they were mortgages or, or judgments, and as a result, the purchaser lost their house because of it. Well, wow, thanks, Sue. What are the pros and cons of borrowing from your 403B or 401K savings towards your down payment? So. That's a question I would definitely ask your accountant um, because depending on where you are in life, um, you know, if you are younger, then you're able to, let's say, recoup that money, if you will, that you use for your down payment, where compared to if you're closer to retirement age, might be something that might not be the best idea to do. But again, I would refer to your accountant in regards to what tax implications you might run into um, and even your financial planner. How much does the attorney fees run for usually, Laura? Well, it depends on the transaction, but I'd say that um, most attorneys uh, nowadays are charging uh, from the low end of 1200 to maybe the high end of 1600 uh, It does depend, like I said, on the transaction. Um, I know our, our firm, we charge a pretty standard and average fee and um, it also depends on what extras you may need what do you need a post-possession agreement do you need power of attorneys um, but most attorneys work with you and try and keep things uncomplicated um, some attorneys do charge by the hour and that way you'll wind up paying uh, a lot more so always ask for a, uh, a retainer statement that will outline what your fees should be and you should never be shocked at your attorney fees. Thanks Laura. <laughs> I will say also considering that this is probably going to be the largest investment that you make in your life, we're talking about six figures, um, it's not something where you want to look for let's say the cheapest, you want to make sure you get the person that this is what they do and this is the only thing they do. That's the reason why we have these people here. Um, where you do have attorneys that they also do other types of law, um, not just real estate. And that's where then, is that who you want to represent you in what probably be the biggest purchase of your home? Nothing against them per se, but a question that you should consider. With low interest rates, what would the optimal down payment percentage be? Is a bigger percentage down always better? Well, the larger the down payment, then, for example, if you're putting 20% down, you don't have to pay PMI, right? So that's, that's good. Um, but again, let me remind you, as a credit union, we have one of the lowest PMI rates available that we offer to our members. What you, do, what you don't wanna do is leave yourself with no money. Um, you don't want to put everything you have into it. You'll, it's always good to have something left over uh, because as a homeowner, 
you'll realize soon enough that there's always something that might pop in that you have to take care of. And the last thing you want to do is get into more debt to take care of it. So it's good to have some money in reserves uh, when you're purchasing a home. On average, how long does the underwriting process take? The underwriting process, I would say with volume, um, is taking about now 72 hours would be the turnaround time, which is still very good compared to other lenders that from people that we've spoken to, attorneys and so forth, which has taken longer. Um, so our turnaround time, again, conservatively 72 hours. Does money that I can use from my 401k towards my first home count as asset when factoring my rate in any different way than cash would? Um, no, it's actually considered, it's still considered an asset. It's not liquid per se. It has to become liquid by you withdrawing from your retirement account. We do use a percentage of what is in your retirement as to what would be the, the maximum amount that you could, you could take out. But it, it's still considered asset, it's still part of your money. The only thing you have to look into is what, what taxes are you paying on that money that you're gonna be pulling from your retirement account. So that's something you should look into. Great. Final thoughts, opening up to our uh, esteemed uh, speakers here. Is there anything that you want to add? Anything that you want to share? I just would like to say that I, I know that everyone here who's done this seminar is always open for questions. You can call my office. You can call any of us. Um, don't feel, you know, like you're obligated once you call us. We're, we're always available and, and we like to uh, make this process a positive experience. Great. And Thanks. thank you. Thanks, Laura. Sue, mm -hmm. anything that you want to add? I just feel that if you really want to buy a house, go for it. There's no time better than now. Interest rates are at their lowest, and I just feel that buying will always eclipse renting. And you can do it. Whether you know it or not, you can absolutely do it. That's great, so thanks. Stephen, what would you like to add? Yeah, I, um, buying it, uh, home ownership is, is an amazing thing. And it's uh, getting to that finish line is, is an incredible part of growing, you know? But the one thing I will say that the most important thing that when I was looking for my, when we as a family were looking for our first house or a second house, the, the greatest thing about looking for that house and the, the, what was so fun to me was going out and exploring different neighborhoods, different townships, getting out of my comfort zone almost, you know? But, from the city, wanted to go out to Long Island, and getting from the South Shore to the North Shore, and in between, there's so many great neighborhoods. If you're looking in one specific area, uh, I had a client looking in Babylon, and uh, they had no idea that there were the ice slips out there, you know, and Bayport, and Blue Point, and Sayville, and they broadened their horizons where they found their they they found a house that was just incredible and they thanked me for it. You know, so get out there, go for those, those weekend rides and uh, make the best out of home shopping. And I just wanna say happy house hunting. And, um, and thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I like to say, you know, echoing what everyone's saying here is, you know, home ownership is something that um, once you partake, once you own a home, it gives you this sense of pride knowing that this is this is yours and it actually changes the dynamic of your family you actually start this legacy um, that now transcends from generation to generation so i think it's it's something that we have the opportunity of buying uh, a home in this incredible country why not take advantage of it and from all of us at Island Federal Credit Union. Hope, we hope this has been helpful. For more information, go to islandfcu mortgages. Thank you for watching.